the you first do this. Oh, oh later, yeah. Okay, got it. So let's um, move to our special joint meeting with the Cal Select Board to discuss East Montpelier Fire Department FY 2023 budget requests and fire engine purchase options. Um, so what does the Cal Select Board think of the budget? Let's just start with that. We have agreed to put into our warning the budget amounts requested by the fire department. Okay. Yep. What so about gonna, So Denise, are you you're gonna vote vote at town meeting on the budget? Correct. Okay. And we and we learned today that S172 passed. It's on yep. the governor's desk and he's expected to sign it like tomorrow or something, so that all of our articles will be by Australian ballot as they were last year. Yep. Or because of the pandemic stuff. So everything will be by Australian ballot. We will hold an informational meeting. And I'm going to ask the board to talk about when that meeting is going to be tonight. It will probably be the Saturday prior to town meeting, which is February 26th. When do you hold okay. yours? Uh, we try to hold it when we have our select board meetings. So yeah. we'll we'll have, I'm not sure we haven't discussed how many we're going to have, but we'll have as many as possible. We you generally have those on the Monday before town meeting and we may have it, you know, other Mondays before that. Okay. Do you have more, you, you hold the more than one informational meeting? Yes, we, we like to because especially with no open town meeting, we want to get out as much information as we can. And yeah. if we do the mail-in ballots, which we may do, though we haven't decided yet, um, we like people to have an opportunity to discuss the issues as much as possible. So, yeah, we should. Uh, we can. Cal Select Board can talk about it. We did an informational meeting last year, and it went really well. Yeah, you only, but you only did one. Right. Yeah. That's. I mean, we're used to doing, we're used to doing things on the floor, so this was all new to us. Yeah. Yeah, we'll probably have more than one. We did last year, so. Okay. So did, did you have uh, equal level turnout at both? If you had two last year? I think we had more than two. Oh, really? And, but good turnout at all of them? And, and a diversified turnout? I wouldn't say we had a great turnout every single one. As I remember, we did not. But we had some turnout. Probably most at the Monday before. Is that correct, Bruce? Yeah, we had the three of them in two in February and then the night before. Yes. And definitely the most was the night before. Yes. And you did and you did that on Zoom? What's that? Did you do it on Zoom? Yes. Yes, we did. So but I guess my question, I wasn't clear. Uh, if you had three meetings, were there different participants at each of the meetings so that I mean if it's all the same people that it's Maybe not worthwhile. So I'm just wondering what the spread is between. No, it's different. It's different people. Okay, that's good information. Thank you. Yeah. Okay, so um, I guess we'll have to go to so the. Is, what's that? I was gonna say, what is? What do you want to do first? I want to ask the East Coast yeah. like what what they think of the budget because I'd like to get that done. Um, I think Judith's concern with the budget last time uh, that vaccines for the health workers were going to cost more money. I think that's what I got out of it, Judith. Is that correct? Hey, what? Can you say that again? Sorry, that was, I was concerned that the not having a vaccine or testing policy would result in more um, EMFD employees being susceptible to COVID resulting in absences, which would impact the ability to provide service, but, but would also impact staffing and the need to hire additional staffing, which might be more expensive, blah, 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 blah. But we've, I've seen um, their new policy and I appreciate the efforts that they've made. So I, um, I no longer have that concern. Thank you. Dallas has not seen the policy. Well, the chief is here and he can go over the policy with you. We're not, we're not going to eat up all night on it, but 
I've talked to uh, Chief Ty twice about the policies. He's given me a huge amount of information. He's got a lot to share with you. Is that what you want to do, Ty, right now? Well, I guess or, I wonder why Charles didn't receive it. I, I, I also want to move on to the beyond the budget. <coughs> um, we have Judith, myself, John, Amy here. Um, what do you think? What do you think about the fire department ambulance service budget? Uh, the rest of the East Mall Police Select Board. I'm fine with it. I approve yeah. it. Would approve it. I'm okay. Yep. And Amy. Yeah. Good. So why don't we get that out of the way? Make a motion to approve that budget. I'd I'd like to see that happen so we can keep moving the conversation on. I would move to approve the East Montpelier Fire Department budget as proposed. I'll second it. All those in favor, please say aye. 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 The ayes have it. They appear to have it. They do have it. So the budget's passed. Um, now, I, I'd like to move to the truck. Is that something you want to move to, Denise? Sure. Okay. So the proposal that the fire department has made to us i'm just going off the top of my mind here but um they were going to pay for a little over half the truck which is 400 and some odd thousand and ask the towns for about 200 thousand 130 was going to come from east Montpelier and 65 from Cowles. is that correct everyone that's a yeah. yes. That's, that, that's one of the proposals they made. I personally think it's a very fair proposal. I don't know what the rest of the select board thinks of it. And I don't know what Cal thinks of it. So here we go. Um, I think from Cal's perspective, the fact that they're paying a, a huge part of, I think for a huge chunk of the truck is really, um, really a good thing. So you're saying Callus is willing to pay the 65 and we're putting it on our warning. Okay. Yep. Okay, good. All right. Fair enough. Um, Judith, John, Amy, what do you all think? Yes, John. I think it's a I think it's a really good deal. Actually, I don't yep. want to give I don't want to give Chief Roland too much credit, but uh, I really appreciate the fact that he picked up, they were going to pick up that large or larger share of what I expected of the truck. Yeah. So I, I, we, I appreciate it. Yeah. I, I'm on the same page with John. Same thing. And Judith? Um, yeah. No, I think it makes sense. I would approve. I, I think one of the things um, I've talked to Ty with is um, if we put it on the warning, which I'd like to do. We do need to say the percentages that the fire department's paying, what the town's paying, and make that quite clear uh, how much the fire department is stepping up to pay for this. And I think that we can word the article in the warning in such a way that it clears that up. It makes that clear, which I think um, is in everyone's best interest. The townspeople know what's going on, and that's a good thing. Yeah, I think the, the clearer we can make it, the better. Yes. Um, yeah. Yes, we know it's a huge expenditure. The fire department's gonna pay a lot of it. I think that needs to be made clear when uh, we ask the townspeople to approve this. So we can do this on a consensus? Just, we don't need a vote or anything, a motion or anything? No, we don't, yeah, I, can, I think a consensus is fine because we're just okay. talking about putting an article on the warning. Okay. Right. Yep. Then, and then when the warning is done, the, the two separate boards vote on approval of the warning. Yeah, but yeah. Are we doing that tonight? No, next yeah, we're, okay, yeah, we're gonna we're not ready to we'll be doing that next week. Yeah, we're not ready to get our <laughs> articles. We're not ready to get our, okay. Okay, so um, as a consensus, does a select board think it's a good idea to put this on the warning. Yes. 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 Okay. okay, great. All right, so we're, Callis, are we done with the fire? Okay, yep, Ty. Um, I just had a quick question if there's thoughts on how it would get 
paid for in terms of like loans. Would Callus take a loan for the 66,000? The East Montpelier would take a loan for its portion. Just so we have a sense of that, of what it would come out to be, you know, once the votes go through um, in terms of actually purchasing the truck. Yeah, Callus would have to take out a loan. Okay. I, I am not I am not for taking out a loan. We have money in our capital reserve. I think we could do it without okay. a loan. I, so I'm the goal the goal is East Montpelier would support its funds through the capital monies. Callus would take out a loan for the sixty six thousand or sixty five thousand right. for its portion, and then East Montpelier Fire Department would take out a loan for the balance of that and carry the note through paying off of the capital over the next few years. So yeah. basically each entity would pay its own portion on its own indebtedness. Yeah. That's, that's my take on it. Now I might be off. What is, is that correct, Bruce? Well, we're throwing numbers around. I thought we had agreed on the numbers. Hopefully we'll get those straightened out. But as far as the East Montpelier being able to take it out of its capital reserve, that's how the warning is phrased right now. Yes. Yes. And that's my perception. Yep. And do we, is just so I'm clear, is the fire department taking money out of their capital reserve or not? Does Duncan have would, to authorize it? We would. So we would take a note out with the bank for the balance of uh, above and beyond the 200,000. And we would carry that note paying the payments out of the capital reserve account on our side. Yeah. With the anticipation then on the front side of it, you know, Callus would have put in its portion, it's going third, and East Montpelier would have put it in its portion. Yeah. Yes, my, my question is, is do we have to authorize the expenditure of the EMFD money out of the capital budget? Yeah. Well, I think, I think that would be an action of a one-time action that would cover the lifespan of the truck, just as we have with the other um, apparatus that we're currently paying for with loans for the ambulance and rescue too. Okay. So, so our warning would be structured so that it it authorizes, in addition to our um, taking a loan out for our share, we would authorize that expenditure for the EMFD from their capital fund. Is that how you're going to do it, Seth? Yeah, that sounds fine. No, Seth, that's not how we would do it. Oh, you would do it twofold then. No, we would not put before the voters the use of the fire department's capital reserve. Oh, right. Of course not. Right. Yeah, we're not going to put that in front of the voters because that's <laughs> something that we always do ourselves. Yeah, the select board decides that. Yes. But we're kind of approving it right now, even though we're not formally approving it. Right. We would have to. Before you buy the truck, we'd have to do that. But it's implicit in this meeting that we do approve that is that because we're not gonna we're not gonna ask the voters to come up to approve us taking the money out of the capital reserve and not approve you guys taking the money out of your capital reserve to pay for the truck we right. can't approve or well there's no point in approving that until we find out if the voters approve the expenditure right yeah so it's all, all one for us yeah yeah, we, yeah, but it isn't really because the way we've we've structured it in the past is that we approve them taking the money out of the capital reserve to pay for those payments. So Correct. that would, but it's an implicit that we're approving it, even though we haven't formally gone through the process by putting it on a warning. Right. Right. That would be the effect. The, yeah, right. Regardless, uh, the effect is that if the Callis voters pass the are taking out a loan for the portion of the truck, then we in turn, as yes. a selector, would approve the the fire department taking money out of the, the capital reserve. Yeah, we would have to do that in a formal meeting. Right. Yeah. Right. Yeah. So, is that your? Is that good? You good on that? <laughs> Yeah, I think that sounds like it covers it. Then you guys will have a warning that's written jointly between the town. So it will show the same wording in Callis as well as in East Montpelier. Yeah, we should coordinate on the wor wording. Yes, 
Yeah. Yeah. I think that would be important. I think that's important. Yeah. And I think the other thing to note, just even once the approval, you know, if, if it gets approved at town meeting and once the truck is ordered, this truck would not arrive until sometime at the very best in the early parts of 2023, maybe mid 2023, the way things are going. I mean, yeah. fiscal year, you mean fiscal year or calendar year time? Um, cal calendar year 2023 on that. So uh, it would it would not arrive for it, a minimum 12 months, maybe to 15 months after ordering timeline. So, you know, if it was ordered sometime in the May, it would be sometime in May of 2023 to June, July of 2023, probably before its arrival. Okay. Makes sense. Okay. So we've done the budget and the truck. Is everyone satisfied with those two items being um, approved as they are and we can move on? Is the other reason- I have a question. Okay. B based on uh, the timeline that you just put before us, Ty, uh, I guess this is a question to you, Bruce, is there any issue with voters approving something in March of 2022 that would not be an expenditure until possibly after July 1st, 2023? But actually, just the opposite. You're because of the way we're. It's all going to be in fiscal year 23. It's uh, just I mean, authorizing well, the select board to do it when it's possible to do it. Yeah, or when it's proper to do it. Right. Okay. Thank but, you. But we're approving our budget for 2023 here, so that falls. Within, it does, that's moot as well. That's we're budgeting for 2023. Provided well, provided at this town meeting. Right. So if the truck is purchased. We, you know, if it came in 2024, it still wouldn't matter, I don't believe, as long as the expenditure is made before. But yeah, I don't think this could authorize an expenditure where, where the money flows out of the pounds in 2024. Right. That's happening. No, this is, this is fiscal 23, and it sounds like the truck would come in fiscal 23. And the expenditure would be 23, so it's not an issue. No. But where it would be an issue. Is if, if it's somehow system. there's a major payment that has to be made when the truck arrives or when it's picked up, and that doesn't happen until the second half of calendar 22. No, no 23. 23. 23. If it happens in fiscal 24, no, 24. if it would happen in fiscal 24, it has to go back to the vote. Yeah, right. yeah, I mean, if the truck doesn't come in, so. in year 23, then we would have to rewarn it for fiscal year 20. Well, unless it had been totally paid for. In other words, it doesn't matter when it arrives. What matters is when the money goes out. Well, yeah, but if we take out a five year. So we just need to pay for it before uh, June 30th, 2023, is what we're saying. Yeah, Ty? Yeah, so there would be no issues with that. We, there's no penalties for prepay or anything. Um, there's some benefit, you know, we save a few percent, but it's very little on the prepay, but there would be no issue if towns approved the monies to go ahead, that we could go ahead and take those monies, expend them within the fiscal year when you needed to, paying the payments to the manufacturer of the truck and, and take care of that issue altogether. So it would be a non-issue. Yeah, it's a non-issue, I think. But. Okay, so do we have anything more to ask of Ty while he's here? Yeah, I guess I want to know what we didn't receive a copy of the policy. So what what is the policy? That ties here to discuss. Yeah, so the, the, it was more of a question directed from East Montpelier, uh, several select board members in East Montpelier to to the East Montpelier Fire Department of if we were all vaccinated and things. And the answer is no, we are not all vaccinated. We have several members, we have several staff people that are not vaccinated. Um, we can forward you the the all the information. Basically, we have we have extensive safety policies and COVID guidance policies that have been in place since the very beginning of this. They're ever changing for us. Working with the health department, working with the hospital, um, as well as internal. And um, you know, in any any world, it's difficult to mandate somebody to say, "Hey, you have to be vaccinated, not vaccinated." But the option we adapted, the only thing then changed that we've done to what we already had in place was adding the option to have somebody test weekly if they choose not to be vaccinated. And um, that will be implemented and started as of February 1st, 2022. So 
So, so that would be a requirement, the testing, Ty? The, the testing will be a requirement for that, you know, and again, that will follow CDC guidelines for as long as those pieces look like they're in place and things. Eventually, this is going to be the new normal. And a lot of these, you know, things will change and adjust as, yeah, as everybody's seeing. Um, so that's the current policy as to what you see. We'll get it in front of you guys where you can see it, but. Uh, Ty, Ty yeah. so PCR test is the accurate one, as we know. Um, it, it's, it would seem to me to make sense that you required a weekly PCR. And then when someone arrives on duty, they do the 15 minute test in addition, because there's a lag, a three day lag on the PCR. And um, so if you require the weekly PCR test, and then when they come on shift, they do a 15 minute test just to, to cover the gaps. And then you're good. Yeah, I think if you read the guidelines, we've got them stat. I think that most likely with that, there will be, if we receive a positive test from, we're probably going to do antigen tests internally on there to start. And if we receive a positive test, then the employee will have to go have a PCR test to clear where they need to be. But, but the yeah. employees can have a negative test, uh, you know, a quick test, and be contagious. I just talked to somebody yep. who came out negative on the, and then it turns out they had it and they were sick as dogs. Yeah. I really don't see how it's even conceivable that we would let someone to be in an ambulance with sensitive people if they haven't been tested on the, uh, the, the more accurate test. The, the antigen test is 50% efficacy. So, you know, you guys are the EMTs. I would think you'd be most schooled in that. Um, and I, like Mark, have a family member who uh, their, their daughter tested positive uh, with the antigen and was positive. The mother tested negative and with the PCR was positive. So um, just FYI, it's, you, you're going to be potentially the EMTs anyway, not the fire people, but the EMTs are gonna be going to houses increasingly of old people, like my neighbor who's on her last legs and um, they could be potentially the reason that the person doesn't make it if they expose them. And you know, just so you know, my understanding is with the vaccines that those like me who are boosted actually mask the symptoms very well. And so I can actually be highly contagious. And if I were an EMT and infect a, say an elderly person with it, who's immunocompromised and kill them unwittingly. Um, so um, it, even for people who are vaccinated, it's really important that they get, I think at minimum, the antigen test to vaccinate people. I think everyone should get a PCR if you're an EMT weekly and then the antigen test to fill the gaps. So you've got Travis here that's had his hand up for a while. Can can you let him speak, Travis Shores? Hey there. Travis Shores from Callis. Um, very quickly, um, I am a prior EMT and firefighter both in Mass and in Vermont. And um, my wife actually works at CVMC right now in labor and delivery, which is also emergent care for a lot of people who come in both with COVID positive symptoms and otherwise. And one of the things that they are seeing quite frequently at the hospital is a rapid test at home proving negative and the PCR coming back positive. It's a new phenomenon that's taking place right now. So it's not really that uh, effectual to say that we're gonna put all our trust in a daily rapid test and think that we're all gonna be right. you know, in any way prophylactic to the actual uh, COVID vaccine or the virus that's out there right now. What, the, what I will say though, is that as an EMT that also worked a lot with law enforcement and hospitals, the rates have been well over four times the amount of COVID spread among first responders that are out there. So there are people right now, I mean, even a coworker of my wife, um, you know, in her family, law enforcement as well, tested negative at home, positive at the hospital after she had already been in contact with sensitive populations of people who had no uh, ability to get the vaccine. So policy-wise, 
Um, I think, and this is my own opinion right now, the most responsible thing to do would be to mandate that people do get vaccines. And when we say we don't hear about anybody ever mandating vaccines, well, that was actually the policy for all our school children up until the COVID ha happened. That, I mean, I got a call the other day about my daughter not getting a hep A vaccine booster in time. And I said, you're calling me about hep A during a <laughs> pandemic that you're not mandating a vaccine for that. Don't we wow. find that a little strange? And so yeah. I always found that if I was going to be in the best care scenario, like I trust my own body, I trust my own health. I did get vaccinated, but you know, I'm a pretty healthy guy. I don't hey. want to be a walking death sentence to somebody unwittingly. And that's kind of where my policy would be right there to do the most diligence I can. If I can have a body that can receive a vaccine to not be able to be in a place where I'm going to affect my coworkers and we're going to lose time and then have to hire people um, and stress the very thin amount of workers that we have currently right now anyway. So that's my two cents. I'll be quiet for now. Thank you. Thank you, thank you Travis. Thank you, Travis. So I, I, I have something else to add. Um, I know it doesn't surprise you, John Jewett. Um, no, it doesn't surprise me at all. <laughs> I'm still awake now. Why don't I go back to 35 years? Um, so we, we uh, Donna Callis, and I think maybe East Montpelier, we were sued, or Montpelier Fire Department were sued uh, under the legal premise that the East Montpelier Fire Department was our, our designate for emergency response and all that stuff. And uh, our insurance did not cover us because East Montpelier Fire Department, passive would not cover us because East Montpelier Fire Department was a private nonprofit and they weren't a municipal entity. So because of that, I don't feel one, that we can compel East Montpelier Fire Department to do anything because they're a private nonprofit. But at the same time, it sets us up for massive liability if the EMTs if we're funding a program such as the EMTs and the trucks and all the training and everything else that leads up to someone knocking on someone's door with a stretcher in hand, um, <laughs> we could be sued. And I think there's very good argument. We would lose for actually getting ourselves bound up in contracts and, and funding programs that are maybe in the eyes of the law, not protective of the populations we serve. So. I just want to put that out there, folks. Good point, John. Thank you. While we may not be able to compel them directly, we have a contractual relationship with them. We can right. put whatever we want in that contract. Well, right, we, I guess we could. Um, but we're not reopening the contract, are we? Well, it's, you've made a very interesting point. Right. There's always the opportunity to no passage wouldn't cover us. Nope. Well, then because I think we've had a real issue here. So I think that um, we've conveyed our feelings appropriately, and Ty can put out the information he has to me. Um, and I think there's some other people, Ty, probably Denise has said something about not getting your protocols or whatever it is. You wanted no, some more? Yes. Yes. We, we, we yes, have more. What's that? If, Go ahead, Denise. If we had had the document that you all have, we might have been more prepared to discuss this tonight. I still actually, don't I, I don't have the document. I, I just okay. talked about it with Ty. I don't have any documents. So, Seth, Seth, a couple of things. One, uh, Callis, if you want to download the documents from the East Montpelier website, you're welcome to do that. They're they're posted there, right on the front page. And uh, two, Ty, I want to thank you and the rest of the fire department for being responsive to our concerns and developing this new policy. Yeah, I do too, actually. Yeah, I, I think, think for clarity, it's a tough issue. It's a tough. I issue. think for clarity, these policies have been in place. The only thing we changed was adding the testing portion of it. And I hear what Travis is saying in the concerns and everything. However, the reality is you can be fully vaccinated and be a carrier and not know it and spread it to whoever. I think the key element here that is the key difference in what we do is the PPE that our staff wears on every call going in. We do not blindly going into somebody's house knowingly exposing, even long before COVID, we don't blindly go in and expose people, right? We're wearing safety gloves, we're wearing gowns where we need to, we're wearing Tyvek suits, goggles, masks, 
eye shields, all kinds of protection methods that are not in place for the typical general public, right? And that is our standard protocol when we go into the hospital. The same when we're exposed to a patient in the back of the ambulance, we have safety procedures that are in place that we uphold and that we do. We do different procedures now differently than we did before because of the COVID. Um, and again, we're under the constant guidance of the emergency room and our med control as to what the standards are. There was a reminder notice that came out from our med control today, you know, just reminding people to be wearing their N95 masks, their eye protection and gloves on all calls and things, you know, and again, it's not because there's a rampant disregard for it. It's sometimes there's some squads around and our squad has been very efficient and effective in wearing the PPE as needed. And I think that is the key difference in what we're looking at here in terms of vaccinated, unvaccinated exposure risk to the general population. So, yes. so the, the CDH, um, I'm assuming that's the hospital you're talking about, um, they, they, your, your policy for protecting against the spread of COVID um, with and without vaccines uh, vaccinated personnel um, are consistent with CVH's policies for you guys. They're good with what you're doing, essentially. Ty? Essentially, yes. I mean, our, ours are not necessarily parallel to or guided by the specific hospital to its employee guidance. However, we have guidance that comes out in, in effective reminders from our, um, you know, from our med control and everything. Um, again, so this is from, this was today. Uh, no, this was, sorry, from the 7th, dated 1-7-2022 from Dr. Ellen Stein, who is our immediate med control for District 6 Ambulance Board. Okay, she says, annoying reminder, please wear your N95 and eye protection on all calls and then whatever possible, even at the station. These are the next few several weeks are going to be rough and something we just need to get through. Again, that's just a reminder from them as we do it, you know, and upholding standards and things. When we go into the hospital, all patients that, that we carry in, transport in, have masks that are put on them prior to arrival to the hospital. So again, we work hand in hand with them and the, the standards that are there. We have no inhibitors to anybody who's not vaccinated that they cannot enter the building through the emergency department. They go in wearing the proper PPE as needed through, through patient delivery. Sounds good. Any more questions for Ty? Any further comments, Cal Select Board? Not now. Not now? Okay. I appreciate you taking the time, Ty, to answer everyone's questions and do things as well as you do. I know it's a lot of work. Tremendous. Yeah, thank you. We appreciate the support and you know we understand the questions, but we do up here and uphold a high level of, you know safety for our individuals and staff, but also more so for the population that we serve. And we fully understand the risks that are out there with this. Yeah. Okay, so thank you everybody. I think, Callis, are you done with us? Are we done with you? I think so, yeah. I think I so. Yeah, uh, send that form along, Bruce, would you? The form? The form, or I'm sorry, the policy that Ty was referencing. I guess it's on the- Send it to Denise. It's on the website. On whose website, the fire departments or East Montpelier's? East Montpelier's. East Montpelier's, right. Okay. We shall look for it. Thank you all. Good to see everybody. Yes. Happy New Year. Stay <laughs> work. <laughs>